So for those of you who are just signing on, uh, take a look at the bottom of your screen and see if you can find where it says, uh, um, has a microphone symbol and a video symbol. Make sure that you are muted, which means that you, your thing says unmute and has a line through the microphone. That means that your microphone is turned off. Make sure your video is turned off because I, I know that most people do not want people looking at them sipping their coffee. And with that, we, we are going to get started. Hello and welcome to Weekend Walkabout in our gardens and yours virtually. And we found out this week that we can get outside and so uh, we're going to send the wanderer, one of us is gonna wander out uh, in other weeks and, and be outside reporting from outside, which is a lot of fun. We, uh, we report from garden a to z.org, which is our labor of love website. Um, this material is copyrighted, which means that we want you to contact us before you use it for groups like this. Go ahead and show it to friends. Go ahead and look at it as much as you want. Those of you who are watching today and our subscribers get a key to watch it in the exclusive library. But for big groups, we want to hear about it before you use it. And our topic today, Diagnosing problems, learning from losses. And I'm Janet. I'm the one who sticks her nose into everything, um, sometimes at my peril. And often tastes. <laughs> often tastes things too. And I, Stephen, I take the pictures of her sticking her nose and tasting. Yeah. Mostly if I'm looking through a lens, I'm looking through a close-up loop or a magnifier looking to see what the heck is eating one thing or another. I, I tend to do most of the heavy research. Steve gets to hear me say, got it, when I find something that uh, figured out. There's a certain tone of voice. Yeah, and, uh, and we find lots of those things when we're out walking and collecting samples. This is our daughter, Sonia Nicola, with the uh, toque. Is that right, Sonia, toque? That is the proper Canadian term. Yes, toque. Um, with our uh, labs out for a walk, you can tell that they've been in the water. Uh, Sonia is with us um, um, just because she's a wonderful gardener and she's a wonderful person and she is a professor at the University of Toronto where they're using lots of virtual technology so she helps us out with uh, keeping the audience uh, uh, microphones off and on as we need them for question and answer session. She's also an excellent gardener in her own right, an incredible gardener um, and has been learning since she was just a wee little thing about everything. Uh, so you might find in chat that she's a great one to ask if there's a question you want to get to. And that's her husband, Cam. Oh, poor Cam. Sorry. Yes, her husband, Cam, is in, Who is in the blue a sweatshirt. brewer. Yeah. Yeah. An excellent brewer. And we are gardeners by trade. Steve and I take care of gardens uh, for clients. We also take care of gardens as uh, um, a way to write and to learn. We took care of this garden at Michigan State in order to write Caring for Perennials. I did all the photography for it. We were able to go to Michigan State and try to do it. Yeah, and we've, ri we've written for a number of years uh, for magazines, newspapers, and in researching and looking for information for other people, we find that that's a great way to learn. We want to keep doing it, but we want to write new stuff, so we started the website so that we could keep putting what we've already written there and, uh, and, and cross-reference it. So uh, you find our, our articles on many of these topics we talk about at our webinars on GardenAtoZ.org. And this is the outline that keeps us on track. We'll be using this today and telling you where we are as we go along. If you haven't downloaded it and find during this presentation that it'd be useful for you, then you find that at GardenAtoZ.org in the About Us section under webinars. Okay, so there are four steps that we're gonna go through today in, we're, we've put them into three chapters. And those steps are to know and notice the plant, do your diagnosis, evaluate the damage, and, and decide and take control if you're gonna if you're going to do control and then what you're going to do. And then it is important, and we're making sure that we add this in there, you always have to cycle back. This is not a linear process, it's a circular process. You, it's really important to go back and keep observing and looking. <laughs> right. And we'll take you through a little reality check and some resources. The first one being as we go into chapter one, know and notice um, that the title is Diagnosing Problems, Learning from Losses. And the idea is that we have to be realistic. Things do die, things do decline. There isn't any way you can save everything. Our environments have been changing. Anybody who lost uh, ash trees in the last few years, elm trees, that changes the environment. Yep. Uh, new pests all the time. The springs are changing and we're losing things to frost, the late frost that we weren't losing before because they were warming up earlier in, the, in mild winter. Um, but we can stay ahead and we can learn from the losses by noticing things sooner and doing more diagnosis. And we find that most of the time when we are learning, we are learning for next year. 
because by the time we notice something for the first time, it's too late, <laughs> probably too late. So that's our reality check to get started. Now we're going to go into the, the meat of chapter one, which is knowing the plant and making a point to look. And the simple points are know what conditions the plant likes and know what it's experiencing. Know what a healthy plant looks like, what the color of the leaf, the size, the growth rate, the, yeah. you know that that fox should be a, an upright plant. Right, um, and that it should have yeah, uniformly green leaves. Um, you know what color the flowers should be and what time of year it should flower. Those things are important. You know when your irises come up that it's okay that they're white because they're zebra iris. It's okay that they are. And, and you might notice on the, the iris on the right, the green ones, that they're small and, and uh, spare, sparse in the middle, telling you, I'm getting old. Time to divide. Time to divide. You, you have to notice these things about Use plants. your eyes. And so on a service berry, you need to know what a service berry looks like and when it blooms. Um, sorry, that wasn't supposed to happen so quickly. Um, you have to know that the new foliage, when it comes out, is supposed to be an off color, uh, even a, a bronzy color, like it's like it's in fall almost. Yeah, and if you see them in the wild, you see that it's a great variation of colors from bronze to pink to orange when they come out, and that's okay. Um, you need to know when they bear fruit and that the fruit does ripen to a, a dark um, blueberry color, and that birds will eat it. And there's nothing to worry about. They've left their telltale. Yep. <laughs> they leave their feathers on there. You know that they're the ones who've been pecking your fruit. And what color it should turn in the fall. All of those things are natural, healthy things for them to do. And you need to watch and say, why isn't mine doing X? Yeah, what it's supposed to be doing. Um, growth rate is something you need to know. It is. There's nothing wrong with this striped maple, also called Pennsylvania maple, but it's got antennas sticking out of it. It is a young striped maple and they grow three feet a year, which means that they are always extending their growth and not yet branching that growth. And it's okay. If um, we walked out in the yard, we could show you ours that grew. We'll, we'll do that. We'll do that next week, probably. So once you know what the healthy plant looks like, um, then you anticipate what its common problems are and when they're going to happen because pest seasonality is big. Pests happen in cycles. Okay at a certain time based on temperature, sun, yeah. various. And so if you know, this is what I'm growing, I'm growing a willow, heaven help you if you're growing a willow. They get pests. They have, there are so many pests that grow on, that, that host on willow. It's a fast growing, big species, been around a long time. It's got a lot of pests. Don't kill, they don't kill the plant, but no. boy, trying to keep up with all of the things that can affect a willow. It's but, a lot. Boy, they soak up a lot of water near near a lake or a pond. Right. We just we just um, prescribed them for someone yesterday mm -hmm. who's got a wet area. Um, on the other hand, peony does not have so many things that happen to it. Um, it does get botrytis. We'll show you that uh, later. It does get chafers. Um, rose chafers will walk, walk walk around on your peonies in certain years but it doesn't get a whole lot that goes wrong with Some it. Some people ask, why are the ants all over thinking they're after aphids, but they aren't. Right, they are not after aphids. They're after the little milky stuff that comes off a peony and they don't hurt anything at all. And you need to know that there are such things as yellow peonies. Yes. We had neighbors who told us repeatedly that that couldn't be a peony. What is that plant? So it's a peony. Can't be a peony. There's no yellow peony. Um, there so are now. You, yeah, so you need to know and watch those things. Um, the yellow peonies, the um, there are a number of colors of ito peonies, the intersectional crosses between the herbaceous standard conventional peonies and the tree peonies, and they're all different colors. Um, the whole group, the intersectional, intersectional peonies, are much more resistant to the diseases that peonies get through a process or through a phenomenon called hybrid vigor. I also, the, their stems are stiffer. They stand up straighter. Steve They're, loves them. I, yeah, yeah. The, the regular peonies flop so easy. Now, if you're trying to figure out what's going to go wrong with a plant and when it's going to happen, then knowing about growing degree days is important. It's, it's critical. Yeah, growing degree days, known as GDD in most um, uh, horticultural books and texts and, and online, are... Um, a measure of how much warmth has accumulated in this growing season. And we have tons of information about when particular insects come out based on when we get to a particular growing degree day. For instance, we know 
the Japanese beetles, we know, we people know, that Japanese beetles emerge when they've had between 1130 and 1360 growing degree days at what's called base 50, don't worry about that right now, since the winter. So once we get through winter, sometime in January, the helpful uh, um, universities that care, take care of our agricultural information begin counting the growing degree days. They take the maximum temperature up to about 86 degrees. Uh, they, they add it to the minimum temperature down to 50. So today it went down to 45. We can only count to 50. And it was 75 yesterday. Um, we take that 20, the, we, add, sorry, we add the two together, the 75 and the 50, because we can't go down to, to, four, to 45. And we say that's 125. We divide it by two, which is 62 and a half, something like that. Subtract 50 and say, we just accumulated 12 growing degrees. And they, they just keep adding them. They just accumulate. And, and you, when it gets to that level, all of the Japanese beetles emerge. It's, it's 1130 degrees. And between, uh, by the time it gets to 1360, they're, they're all, all gone. Out. They're all out of the ground. And, and, and if you were treating for the ground treatment, it, they're already out. <laughs> That's right. You yeah. got to watch growing degree yeah. days and say, why would I spend the money on something to kill grubs in the ground when, sorry, all the Japanese beetles are out eating things right now. On the, say, on the other hand, if you know that now is when they're going to start coming out, and if you kill the first ones that come to your yard, they don't call in others because they accumulate in big bunches. So if you know, start right at the beginning. Don't wait until there's a big bunch. And generally, like everything, the younger an insect is, the easier it is to get it. To kill, because they can make a mess of things. Now that's, the, the, the flower on that hibiscus was dying anyway, but having Japanese beetles chewing holes in it is just offensive. It, it drives like people crazy. on top of. Um, we have our grandkids chase them around. They also happen in cycles. You get years where there's lots of them and years when there's yeah. less. So we go to, um, Steve and I, go to Michigan State to find out what growing degree days we're at. There's this great thing online that we can go in and put in what station we want to Commerce or Milford or, and, uh, and what date we want and execute. And we get a map. Well, actually, we started with the map that says where we are. And the map is telling us how many growing degree days have been accumulated in various places in the state. So up north, they've only, in the Upper Peninsula, they've only reached 690 uh, growing degree days. Notice they don't even show up in there. <laughs> that might actually, to be honest, it no. might be more. Yeah, that's, meanwhile, we're, we have twice as many growing degree days. So we get past earlier uh, than they do there. But what you do, it tells you in Commerce Township, you're up to 1128 on July 11th in the year that, that I captured this picture. And uh, uh, a week later, you were up to 1312. You go, ha ha, right in there. There's where your Japanese beetles were coming out at that time. Other states have the same thing. I first started looking for our growing degree days when I got very jealous of Ohio's. They have this great calendar tells you what's blooming right now um, and, and which thing, these plants are indicators of growing degree days. Um, American elder is in full bloom at the, at the time when you have the number of growing degree days that are 907. So I don't even have to look online. If I start learning plants, I can go, the Japanese beetles come out when the hydrangea, the white ones, are turning from green to white in that ball. Boom, and that's when they're coming out. It's really it, quite cool to see all the information yeah. there. And they are, they're all out there. If you go into a, a search engine and you put in growing degree days, Illinois, it's going to take you to another thing that I, I envy because Illinois even shows you what the soil temperature is. All those corn farmers out there <laughs> want to know that. And I want to know when it's warm enough to do uh, uh, tomatoes. Wisconsin makes it a little bit harder. You got to do a couple of jumps to get to the bottom of their degree day calculation article and find um, a uh, reference just like University of Massachusetts has to the great information that Oregon State ke keeps for the whole country and that the USDA keeps, so they, they hand you off to growing degree days um, on charts that let you do the whole country if you wanted to do. Penn State has a new calculator, I haven't used it yet. So they're all out there and they're telling you that growing degree days are important, calendar isn't as important. The plants bloom according to growing degree days and the insects come out by growing degree days. So I've, and every day, every year is different. Yeah, every so here, year. here's um, uh, blue highlighted two ranges, 1130 to 1298. So that's the Japanese beetle range. And down below, 1126 to 1330. 
It's called growing degree days on the basis of 50, 50 degrees. And if you look at those two, those are for two different years. In 2012, we hit that temperature between June 21st and June 28th. In 2013, we didn't hit that temperature till July 4th. So it moves. It moves based on whether it's a cold spring, a warm spring, um, rainy weather, and you want to keep track of that stuff. In our, in our uh, material that we gave you today, we gave you our list that, that we made up that gives on average the dates and the, uh, a bunch of the information, a bunch of the pests that we have information for. It works this way. You have your month. Um, well, we'll, do, we'll, do, we'll, we'll look at the, what the categories are. You have your month in the first column and the dates. So April 5 to 20. You're usually in the growing de in the degree day range of 50 um, uh, of, of about 32 to up to 50 degrees. And the pest that at that point you'd be watching for is Zimmerman pine moth pest, which is in its first larval state and is on the pine bark in the main truck. And um, these kind of information can be very valuable. Because when, you, when you're looking, when the one that you're looking for, like webworm or tent caterpillar or black vine weevil or Japanese beetle is on here, you can say in general, someplace around the middle of July, when you're at growing degree days, 1130 to 1360, you're going to get your first adults and they're going to be on many plants on the foliage and all over. So then you know that's when I'm going to look for those guys. So we gave you that, but we're also telling you go online because it shifts from year to year. And go out and shake hands regularly with your plants. That's what we call Look it. at them. Not just look at them. Look at the underside. Get down and, and examine. Look at the new growth. Is it being damaged? Look at the low parts, like I said, and look under and look for sheltering pests underneath. Yeah. And, and when you see changes, check them out. So I'm, I'm looking at the stewardia and saying, okay, there you are in May. And you're leafing out really slow. And really, you're pretty thin in July. I'm not just going to walk by you. I'm going to walk up to you and look at the leaves. I'm going to look under the leaves. I'm going to look at the new growth, see what's going <coughs> on. That tree was incredibly stressed by terrible roots. Um, we know about those kinds of things. But you're always going to try to look under the leaf as well as above. The, the top may look fairly good to you, but then you go underneath and you see all the pustules. And uh, this, all is a, the... this is azalea sawfly. Uh, azalea lace bug, that sorry, postures. that's feeding on the underside of the leaf. And most of the insects are going to hide on the underside of the leaf and they're going to have excrement. It's going to get sticky. It's going to get messy on the underside of the leaf. You see a messy leaf and you start thinking, what can I do about this? One of the first things you think about is clean the leaf off, mm -hmm. spray it with water, especially water with some, with, uh, some, some soap in it. Uh, you knock insects Often off. Often a of hard it. spray of water works yeah, you knock them down into an incredibly hostile environment. When they hit the ground, things eat them from everywhere. So looking at the underside of the leaf on the linden tree, you'll see not only aphids, the little yellowish green things, but eggs are there. And, and you see there is a predator. That is the ladybug larva. Going to be a lady beetle someday. And it will eat a lot of aphids. It'll eat at least those aphids times two that are on there, because 30 a day is nothing for a lady. Watch them chase them. Yeah, it's fun. You also look at growth rate. You could notice the difference in the color of the twig, and there's a, there's a um, terminal, bud scar. Terminal, terminal bud scar that wraps around the whole twig on the majority of trees and shrubs. Yeah, so look on the outside, see that it's more of a honey, honey brown on the on the left on that twig, this is a linden tree. And then right at the terminal bud scar, the line that goes all the way around the, the twig, it, goes it changes to a more silvery color because more bark is developing. So that's telling us that this linden is growing about two to three inches a year. And that's like, That's not good. You look in any book and it tells you that tree. a linden should be growing eight to 12 inches a year. And you go, something is up. So when people say, how long do I have to keep watering something? How long do I have to worry about this new plant I put in? Until it begins growing at, to its potential. So this guy is still in need of help. And that means looking at the roots too, which we've talked a lot about. Yes. How and much root has grown. Probably always will. Um, if the branch grows eight inches, the root probably grows three times as much as that. 24. And roots do look different. You can tell which ones they are. I was working with someone in their, her yard yesterday and, and said, well, those are burning bush roots. She said, really, you can tell. Yes, you can tell. You learn the roots the more you work with them. Burning bushes in the middle. It's... 
Um, sorry, that's yeah, I really do. Um, so I was looking at this oak tree uh, with a client who wondered why it had kept its, it had dropped its leaves before the neighbor's oak tree. So his oak tree in the foreground, neighbor's oak tree in the background. Um, the first thing we did was we looked at the leaves and said some of these leaves are kind of chewed up and the growth rate was is so minimal abysmal there's the terminal bud scar this oak was growing an inch a year and we could trace it back bud scar to bud scar to bud scar it had been getting worse for 10 years so we wrote about it we wrote an article called check tree for trouble it tells you things like checking growth rate how to check what the leaf and the wood look like how the trunk um, and in that went through the whole process of shaking hands with this plant of how big the leaves should be and how big they were. Ask questions, has there something, been construction around? Did they pave the street? Did they do Did they uh, stack, septic field? Did they stack, stack stuff shingles, underneath? Yeah, uh, construction material underneath. Uh, was it treated, was it, a neighbor plants treated um, right. 10 years ago with something? Right, because those things matter. So we wrote this all up and you can follow these. We wrote these and we write other problems up to say, here's what we looked at. Here's what we found out. This was one of the ones that I did a aha on um, and wrote it, wrote it up for you. Check tree trouble. And it's gardenatoz.org. We forgot to change that on this one. We've got all, all but 35 pages moved of the thousands of pages from the old .com that your phones .org. couldn't use yeah. over to .org. We're almost done. Almost oh, out of money, too. Yeah. yeah. OK, so what questions do you have about knowing and noticing problems? Um, anything that you, you've got there? Um, well, we've got uh, got a, a couple of problems. We also have a uh, a whole little section on peonies. Um, would you like to do a little section on peonies first? Let's do a section on peonies. Okay. So Carol is asking, uh, how do you get your peonies to have more blooms? Um, I suggested maybe dividing, uh, but uh, then Elizabeth said, what's the best time of year to divide and move peonies? So that's the first cluster. Take us down to examples, Steve. Um, one of the, whoops. Okay. Just click on examples. And uh, let me just go down to peonies here. Um, one of the best things that you can do on peonies is this time of year as they're blooming, ignore, uh, excuse me that I'm showing pictures that uh, we're not talking about. I'll come back to these later. I didn't have the chance to put them all in the order that I wanted to put them, just put them in. Sonia loves these things. This time of year, when you're looking at peonies blooming, oh, this is not gonna work so well. Um, Steve, if you would just go back to Q1. We'll show you the peonies pictures later. They come up later. Um, sorry, we're always trying new things on these presentations, yes. and that's we're going to take some time on that one. This time of year, look at the tips of the branches to see whether or not you have a brown, dried up bud that didn't open. Um, because what can cut down the number of buds that you flowers you get on your peony is the flower buds being killed, and they're killed by frost and or botrytis, an inf a fungus infection. If the peony is coming up early, as peonies do, and we get a, a cold snap, the tip of the stem can get killed, and that tip of the stem has the embryonic It had bud the in bud it. in there. So. Once the bud gets killed, it's dead tissue that is very susceptible to a fungus called botrytis, and that botrytis stays on the plant, and the next year, as the plant comes up, it's even more susceptible to it. So if there are brown, unopened buds on a peony, go this time of year before that botrytis gets a chance to spread to the rest of the plant and clip those off and, and get rid of them. And if you notice any purple going down the stem, keep cutting. Cut the whole stem. Anything. Stem. Yeah, we'll yeah. show that a little bit later. Well, but, but keep a cleaner peony and clean it up in the fall. Make sure that you cut all parts of the peony all the way down to the ground. Nothing should show um, every fall because that is peony's big problem is that fungus problem and it will kill flower buds. If that doesn't, if, if you don't get more flowers that way, you probably need to put the peony into more light because they don't bloom very heavily in the sun, in the shade at all. Yeah. They'll grow in the shade, but they won't bloom very well. Does that help? Yeah, and then we actually have a, uh, uh, an appropriate follow-up that um, uh, Nancy is saying that she has an Edo peony uh, copper kettle, three years old. It was blooming profusely this year, but most blooms are opening distorted, even though buds look unscathed before opening. That um, there are um, psyllids, not psyllids. There is an insect, the name is escaping me right now, a group of insects that live inside, that, whose eggs are laid inside flower buds 
and that can thrips that can distort the flower bud as it comes out. It's possible that you have thrips. I haven't heard of that problem on peonies, but it can happen. It can also happen that the flower buds can get um, damaged while they're forming. And this year, with as much cold as we got, I kind of expected to see some damaged peonies, peony flowers on the peony that's in our wind tunnel next yeah. to the house. We have a, a idle hybrid there and it it's blooming quite well. I, yeah, but I, 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 did, I didn't expect it to make, come up so well. So now thrips are extremely tiny um, and you need a magnifier to see them. So you'd wanna take one of those um, peony flowers inside and take it apart and use a loop like I do to look at it. Mm -hmm. So, or um, uh, you can you can put it in a baggie, um, a paper baggie, not a plastic bag. You don't want it to rot, and send it to us. Um, we we get all kinds of weird things. Our our mailman, like nicely enough, is a gardener, and kind of knows what's going on. All right, and then uh, Chris has a frustrating case of uh, a beautiful Bartzella peony this year, but it uh, had absolutely no blooms. My other peonies in the same bed bloomed beautifully. Any ideas on why? Now, didn't clarify whether um, there were the, the, the brown, brown uh, buds, buds uh, but, but uh, would there be anything uh, else besides that? Uh, if, the, if the peony was in a condition to bloom, but was thwarted from blooming by the weather or some other environmental problem, there would be buds, brown buds that didn't open. Um, I haven't seen it on the Ito peonies, on the intersectional peonies yet, um, but it can happen. Uh, and this year would have been a prime time to happen because it got, the peonies were up and growing. And then it, it froze twice that I can yeah, remember. It, uh, I might have been three. So I'm take a good look at the tips of the stems. They're very tiny. They were just forming when that came up and all you have to have is that little brown tip to tell you that what should have been a big fat bud by now a month later was killed as a little little tiny tip in which case just clip it off and uh, and give it till next year because those are very reliable plants yep so chris is just saying that uh, there are no brown buds that uh, that i can see um uh, we're also getting a lot of questions. We're almost through the peony section, folks, but uh, that seemed to have been a popular um, image uh, there. Okay. Um, uh, several people are asking about the best time to divide and transplant peonies. The, the best time to do them is in the fall when the roots are least brittle. They just are, it's easier to handle. But as Roy Clem from, from Clem Song Sparrow Nursery, <coughs> Third thousands of third, peonies. Yes, third generation peony grower. They grow peonies in the field. In, by acres and they put them out in blocks. I had spoken at a conference and he came after me and he said, what she said, right, you can do them anytime. They divide, they, they take many of their peonies out of the growing field at bloom time because that's when they can tell when they've mixed up the wrong plant into the block that should be all red. I mean, you wanna make sure you're, <coughs> you're tagging the right plant and what better way if with a peony than the bloom. Yeah, so what they do is they go out into the field when the peonies are blooming, and if there's a white one in the red block, the rules are that the, the workers pull it. They just take it out of the ground. Yank it. And set it in the, in the row, in the middle of the row. At the end of the day, the farm trailer tractor comes down the row with a trailer behind it. All the workers jump on the trailer, throw all the peonies on the trailer, and they ride back in and, and they compost those peonies. They don't go looking for where they belong. They just get rid of the ones that weren't the right ones. And many of the workers, according to Roy, take the peonies home and they grow just fine. They've been yanked out of the ground in full bloom, laid on the ground all day long, sat upon on a trailer. And who knows what time of year. Yeah. So do it whenever you want to do it. But the best time is in the fall. Great. Okay. Peony section done for now. Okay. Um, we also have, uh, let's see, we've got two questions about um, hydrangeas. Um, so Michelle says, I have a, a 10 year plus old limelight hydrangea. It's been slowly getting bare legs and many dead branches. Some of the branches I cut off have a black cylinder hole that goes to the center. Thoughts? Carol suggests borer. Um, yes. Would that be, sounds you right? You guys are good. You guys take care of this on your own. Uh, Michelle, good observation. When you cut the branch, if it's hollow in the center, it probably has borer. There's a dogwood borer that likes to get into hydrangeas. And it is, a, it is a real good reason to keep your hydrangeas young by continually cutting some branches off and keeping new ones coming. Because the borers can only survive in a larger caliper branch. So if you've got younger, thinner wood on the majority of the plant- Encourage you, that. Yeah. 
but, along with lilacs but it too. probably is borer and uh, you may have to cut your older stem all the way down which you can do now the best time is in early april because then pff, they just come right back up but you can do it now it'll come back up great and then stacy says uh i have an incredible spirit hydrangea that has some deformed leaves they look shriveled should i remove them um well, it's always a good idea. Cleanliness is a great idea because if it is a, a, a fungal or bacterial disease, you're taking some of the, the uh, um, pathogen and the resting bodies that could infect other things out. Um, but chances are that if you've got some, some uh, withered leaves, you have a sucking insect or a problem in the water conducting part of the branch. There's either some damage in the branch or something was or is sucking on that leaf. Um, if it's a bigger branch, take a look for borer damage because when you get enough borer damage, the water doesn't move as well through a, a branch. So um, do some clipping and look to see what you've got on the inside of that wood. Michelle's got you figured out there. Look for that, that empty spot. And there's Great. a clover, red clover you can plant for the bunny rabbits too. Uh, yeah, and uh, just Michelle did note in the chat about clover and bunny rabbits that taking the clover out um, would also be uh, detrimental to the bee population. So there's a balance to strike in. All right, that's things. true. And, yes. and we are worried about bees. Uh, when I was walking, and this is not today, but I walked this field where there's thousands of clover, millions of clover, and I saw one honeybee. One bee. And we have our pea plants were in bloom for a week before we saw any pea, flow, uh, and, and, uh, pea pods on them. And I blame this on neighbors shooting, shooting stuff around into all the bushes indiscriminately thinking they're killing, killing mosquitoes. Killing mosquitoes. <sighs> that, that, that practice has got to stop. Yeah. All right, we have um, two questions on yellowy leaves. Uh, I'll ask them both, even though they're quite different plants. Margaret is asking about clematis with lower yellow leaves, lower quarter of the plant. And Gretchen says that her rhubarb leaves turn spotted yellow every year. It's already happening this year before summer. Is it a shortage of nutrients? Is it diseased? Um, and a frutillary imperialism is in the same bed, or happening yeah. in the same bed. Yellowing leaves can be nutrient deficiencies, particularly if it's the older leaves on the plant turning yellow, gradually turning yellow and then dropping off yellow. Um, when that happens, it's often the plant itself withdrawing nitrogen from the older leaves and putting them into the younger leaves and can definitely be the case with a clematis. Um, clematis are greedy plants. They, uh, they, they tend to need a little more nitrogen than other things. So nitrogen might help with the clematis. Although if it's in a lot of, uh, if it's in a shady area, not in a lot of sun, it can also sacrifice those leaves in order to put more leaves up into the light. Its object is to climb. Yeah. The problem with the rhubarb is another problem. Um, this, the, the leaves are not turning uniformly yellower and yellower and, and dying back. They're turning yellow in patches, almost certainly. And that's a fungal infection, and it's probably mildew. We tend to think of mildew as being white, but mildew is white when it is reaching the state where it can make spores and spread itself. If mildew infects early, which it could do this year because it was cold and it was damp for quite a while, it's in the leaf destroying the chlorophyll, making the leaf turn yellow, but the conditions aren't right for it to sporulate yet, so you never see the white. You just see the leaf dying back from the infection. And in the case of the rhubarb, as with the hydrangea for, um, for Stacy, take off bad looking leaves. You see any spots on the rhubarb, remove the leaf. You're not hurting the plant, take the leaf off, it'll grow back. It works with all the Pumpkins, mildews. squashes, cucumbers. You see a bad looking leaf, even a little bit of bad on it, take the leaf off. The plant will produce another one. It's, a, yeah, it's amazing and it stays so much cleaner. People are so afraid of taking a big old leaf off, but do it because the fungus is doing it but, yeah, right For in front you, of anyway. you and spreading. All right, great. I noticed you had the next uh, slide ready to go, so we'll save the, uh, the, the remaining couple for the next Q&A. Okay, great, sorry. Okay. I was just uh, shaky fingers rushing us there. Okay, so that's it for chapter one of diagnosing problems learning from losses. Um, we're glad that people could come and see this if they want to continue on the recorded version of this seeing chapter two, stick with us. Otherwise, uh, get out into your garden and go look at your plants because that's what we've been talking Enjoy. about.